Uh, before sharing my uh, slides, first let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ahmed Daif, and I'm an Associate Professor of Operation and Supply Chain Management at Cal Poly. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, with uh, the SPDC uh, and uh, the CIE uh, events. And uh, uh, for today, basically, we will uh, have a very uh, squeezed in uh, workshop uh, or seminar to be uh, more precise since we are not really interacting as a typical workshop. Uh, and uh, the objective of this uh, workshop will be to give a quick overview on what is manufacturing and what, what are manufacturing systems. Uh, I'm assuming that many of the attendees and those who will be listening to this uh, recording uh, have a, a kind of a mild uh, uh, and a minimal background about manufacturing. So uh, I'll, I'll try to go through a lot of different concepts and different uh, things, but the, the, the main objective of this uh, uh, workshop will be to give you kind of a quick background and also to get you to ask the, the, the right questions and use the manufacturing lingo in act asking these questions and also have kind of a list of what documents as a startup who's planning and intending to get into manufacturing at some phase, and hopefully it's a, it's a very soon phase in your uh, evolution, uh, how, what kind of documents you need to really make sure that you have and what do they uh, uh, help you doing, what information they actually capture. So let me share my screen. And let's get going because uh, uh, this is basically a very uh, compact uh, presentation in one hour and a half. We'll try to really uh, uh, give a quick overview on multiple topics that each one of them can be a workshop by itself. Oops, I don't know why let me go. Well, okay, so the outline will start basically with a quick overview of uh, uh, what are manufacturing systems. And then uh, I'll dwell a little bit into the manufacturing management uh, uh, documents and, and what kind of procedures you need to make sure that at least you are aware of, you start to put them in place when you are building uh, the different uh, blocks of your uh, startup and company. And uh, based on a lot of the feedback that I had from uh, uh, previous clients at uh, the SBDC, uh, people like you guys, Quality control is always a hot topic, so I'll try to dedicate some time at the end to specifically zoom in a little bit into the concept of quality control and what do we mean by that and how can you incorporate this as you grow uh, as a company. So manufacturing systems in general are, and this is again kind of a theoretical background, but to know where are you positioned. It's, uh, we're going to go quickly over this but it's important to really position yourself uh, among uh, the different classifications of manufacturing systems. Usually we look into manufacturing systems from a spectrum of a volume and a variety. One end would be the high volume, low variety, and the other end of the spectrum would be a low volume, high variety. And uh, with each uh, one of these classifications come kind of uh, specific characteristics in terms of flexibility, in terms of labor intensiveness or capital intensiveness. Uh, uh, and uh, usually, if you are among uh, uh, those who are in very close to the high volume or intending to, uh, uh, because I know that at this stage you can't really uh, know where are you standing, but if you are planning to reach kind of a mass production or a scale up production and high volume, this is basically you're going to be looking into manufacturing systems uh, 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 and configurations that have dedicated machines, not that flexible machines. Uh, a high capital intensive at the beginning uh, uh, that will pay off later on. And if you are uh, on that other side of the spectrum, looking into a variety of products, maybe not that big in terms of volume, but uh, a wide, uh, what we call product family, uh, you will be more uh, uh, toward uh, a, a job shop uh, kind of, or a service shop kind of uh, uh, production where you expect uh, uh, equipments and machinery that's more flexible, uh, uh, higher labor intensive uh, kind of environment. Uh, and, and, and this each one of them definitely comes with different, for example, budgeting and planning uh, and what have you. So this is the first thing I'd like to throw uh, uh, on you, the, where uh, uh, do you think you're gonna be standing later on down the road uh, when you scale up your uh, very good idea of a product or service that you're working on? If you're gearing toward manufacturing at high volume, then you need to know that this would be a more of a mass production, dedicated machinery, high capital intensive at the beginning. And if you're more into that variety, high variety, uh, then it's the flexibility and the labor intensive uh, configuration. And 
to be honest, most of uh, uh, the cases will always be somewhere in between or will evolve into different uh, hybrid configuration as they evolve uh, in, into the market. The other thing that I'd like also to put just as a background quickly before we get into the uh, different manufacturing documents uh, is that uh, uh, terminologies that also you need to be aware of if you are getting into manufacturing uh, uh, of uh, what kind of manufacturing uh, uh, strategy are you adopting because this uh, uh, relates to a lot of uh, uh, market characteristics like for example your response time or your delivery time so uh, there is the if you go if you look into this slide and we go from bottom up basically uh, the, the mass production and the high volume usually adopt something called make to stock mts here uh, stands for make to stock where their mass production machinery and facility is actually stocking and piling up a lot of inventory that will stand there and would, they will respond to the market based on a forecasted data uh, and uh, they would forecast to the market from the uh, uh, stocked inventory. And this is why they have a very high responsive rate. Uh, their lead time, which is that gray arrow, uh, uh, double head arrow that you can see there, is basically very short. It's the shortest among others. And the downside of that is, as we said earlier, this will require high level of inventory. And this comes with a holding cost, with a risk of inventory obsolescence. Uh, uh, sometimes market can shift direction and a lot of this inventory will not be as useful as it was expected to be. But uh, the service level and the need time is definitely at a very uh, high level and advantages for that company. The other strategy that uh, other companies can evolve into is what we call uh, uh, assemble to order or build to order. And this is basically where you think of your manufacturing system as a system that will uh, try to have uh, in the back end some kind of manufacturing to uh, uh, an expected uh, uh, market demand, uh, but you are a little bit skeptical about whether this demand will really be realized or not. You know, for example, that if you are building computers, for example, or desktops or laptops, that 80% or 70%, for example, of customers usually tend to use this kind of processor or this kind of screen or this kind of hard desk. So you start to ascend, you start to basically manufacture these essential components that you know it will happen, but the final configuration of the end product, you will wait on this till you have the real uh, order coming from the customer and you'll assemble accordingly or you'll build accordingly. This is uh, an approach to try to mitigate the risk of high inventory and obsolescence and losing touch of the market, uh, but definitely this will come at the expense of a little bit longer lead time than the make to stock. And then if you move up in the same screen here, you'll find make to order, which is even that manufacturing process will wait, will be delayed a little bit till you have real order and you start the manufacturing process based on the order itself. This is definitely a very lengthy lead time. Think about, for example, a lot of the furniture companies where they ask you to pick from a catalog, for example, and then they start to assemble, or they start to manufacture. Uh, 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 what you uh, ask for and they give you a lead time of maybe two to three weeks, sometimes four weeks, right? And uh, so again, uh, uh, you are out of the risk of having high level of inventory and paying for a capital of manufacturing uh, activities that are not realized yet, but definitely this comes at the expense of the lead time that the customer is expecting. And last on that spectrum would be what we call engineer to orders. This is more on the service level, but also some manufacturing happened to, the, to be there where the customer, you don't even know exactly what you would like to order. You know roughly, the, for example, I like to have a, 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 a private jet or I like to have a luxurious mansion, for example. So they come to these uh, uh, companies and enterprises and they have them even from the design stage, from the early design stage. And then they started to purchase what they uh, uh, agreed upon in terms of design. And then they manufacture, assemble and ship. Uh, and this is definitely at the longest lead time to really uh, uh, customize exactly what the customers are looking for. So the idea of this slide is to tell you also that out there, there are a lot of different manufacturing strategies, right? It's not just how, how are, you, are you positioned within product volume and product variety, but also what kind of delivery strategy and manufacturing strategy are you adopting? Is it a make to stock? Is it a, a assembled to order, make to order or engineered to order? And of course they are linked to that volume variety uh, uh, concept that we discussed earlier. So this is uh, basically just to give you a quick idea on the concept of manufacturing system. Right? This is as a system. 
again, uh, to build a very, very quick background on manufacturing before we get into the documents, uh, uh, generally when we speak about manufacturing, we are speaking about two general uh, uh, categories. It used to be only one category, by the way, till recently in the last maybe 15, 20 years with the 3D printing happening uh, and the streamlining. Uh, uh, we have now the additive manufacturing in addition to the subtractive manufacturing. The very popular one is the subtractive manufacturing, where basically you have raw material, right? Uh, metal, uh, for example, sheet or uh, 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 a big piece of a wooden sheet, for example. And then you start to take off of that raw material to shape it into an end product. And so it's called subtractive. You are actually eating out from uh, the raw material uh, using uh, a different uh, drilling, uh, a lathe, a milling machine, whatever, and you end up with that end product. Uh, recently now, we have the additive manufacturing, and again, I'm throwing this on you because now more and more as you evolve in, uh, as a startup into manufacturing, additive manufacturing and 3D printing is actually uh, uh, getting to be more popular and not as cost uh, uh, expensive as it used to be, and the quality is actually getting better and better with more uh, materials uh, that can be uh, 3D printed, right? So, and it, from the name, your action set of actually getting the raw material and 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 cutting it into the final shape, you're actually adding substrates of uh, whatever the material you're using in your printing to get your final product. Of course, we don't lose sight of what we call assembly, but assembly is part of the manufacturing system. It's not a manufacturing process, right? So, usually, there will always be some kind of manufacturing. At, at upstream level uh, uh, somewhere in, in your uh, product story. And then uh, these different manufactured products will definitely downstream come to a point where they will get together in what we call the assembly process. This is kind of the story of uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, systems in general. So this was a quick, quick, quick overview uh, on manufacturing systems. Since you guys are interested in manufacturing, uh, you, you need to know that this is how people, uh, uh, practitioners in that field are speaking about manufacturing systems. What's your product volume? What's your product variety level, right? Volume variety is a very important concept. Are you a make to stock or a make to order or assemble to order or engineer to order? What kind of strategy? Because this will have its impact on the level of inventory, the intensity of manufacturing and the lead time that you're actually gonna promise your customers. And finally, when you sit with, with your, for example, uh, engineers or your uh, subcontractors or your outsourcing uh, uh, partners and speak about manufacturing uh, processes, generally they are either subtractive manufacturing processes with different machinery doing different stuff to a raw material that's there, or currently now there is a trend really in using additive manufacturing and there will always be downstream at the end of that manufacturing story a final assembly somehow uh, uh, for these uh, products. So this was a quick overview on manufacturing systems. Before I proceed, questions, comments from those who are lively attending. And I think Madison enabled you guys to just chime in if you like, unmute yourself and ask questions if you need, or comment. Clear? Okay, excellent. And as you can see, this will be kind of the pace of the whole <laughs> One hour and 10 minutes left, uh, I'm trying to really cover a lot of ground, but please stop me at any time and just ask any question or comment or, or uh, let me repeat if you like, no problem at all. The next, which is the bulk of what I'd like to share with you today is the concept of manufacturing management and what documents we need to actually uh, have. And again, this is basically based on my maybe two years and a half now a relationship with the SBDC and the, uh, the CIE hothouse with all startups that are coming like you guys uh, to think about manufacturing, right? Uh, at, at, an, at a stage where they believe in their product uh, or the service and they, they feel that they're gonna scale it up somehow. So what should we do? And uh, again, this is classically the full fledged of the story, whether you're going to need all these documents and all these processes or not, it's, it definitely depends on the type of the product and uh, the type of market and industry you are engaged in. But this is kind of the full story. And uh, I would start with forecasting quickly, because this is not definitely uh, the scope of what uh, this uh, workshop is about. And then these uh, three uh, uh, documents in, in, in red are mainly related to the product itself or the service that you are planning to manufacture. And the blue uh, uh, documents uh, down there 
are actually related to the process itself, right? So some product related documents and some process related documents. And of course, they definitely uh, uh, complement one another. They, they, they share a lot of common data and common information, but uh, uh, maybe this kind of categorization will also help you to organize uh, uh, your way of thinking, your priorities, uh, uh, and, and, and again, to engage in a fruitful discussion with your manufacturing team, whether this would be in-house or outsourced uh, manufacturing team. Uh, although we are here to speak about product and process, but I can't uh, uh, not uh, start from the forecasting activity, the demand there. Because as much as we are the supply side of the story, uh, uh, we need to have an idea as manufacturing people about what kind of demand signal are we chasing, right? Because you're not producing for the sake of producing, and you're not really generating a service just because you like to generate a service. You are trying to fulfill a demand. And this basically a couple of slides to highlight how important you guys need to have a clear idea about the demand data and the demand signal that you will pass on to the manufacturing people. Because uh, you have also to understand that you can't just pass on the raw demand data to manufacturing and expect people in manufacturing uh, world to use it exactly to plan for manufacturing. They will manage that data, they will definitely cluster some of this data, they will try to streamline it because in many cases, the real market demand is so noisy and so changing and so stochastic that you can't couple and you can't really link manufacturing products, uh, production and manufacturing systems uh, directly to it. So, uh, so bottom line, you need to do some good effort trying to forecast data, right, and have a prediction of the future. And when you do that, uh, and again, uh, you definitely will get better uh, help and consulting from uh, uh, marketing people regarding this, but you need to understand that uh, uh, when you pass information about manufacturing to, about sorry, about marketing to manufacturing teams, you need to uh, uh, clear it and clean it as much as possible from what we call uh, 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 the embedded patterns, right? Or at least give them a signal that basically these demand data have, are exhibiting these kind of patterns, right? whether there is a, a, a stability or, or, or a horizontal demand data, which is the easier, definitely the easiest to uh, couple a manufacturing system to it, or there's an increasing trend, uh, decreasing trend, there's a seasonality, a cyclical trend into it. The reason I'm saying this is usually operation and manufacturing people would like to deal with less noisy and erratic data. Right? So you, when you capture the data, when you forecast the demand, uh, you need to make sure that you do some good demand management and cleaning of the data before actually planning manufacturing accordingly, right? So you need to be as realistic as possible when you forecast and when you capture the market demand, but also you need to be as uh, uh, stable and as uh, co uh, uh, constant and uh, uh, consistent as possible when you pass this into the manufacturing. It doesn't mean that the manufacturing will not adapt, but, uh, but definitely is, will, will be within a limit. We usually have multiple forecasting techniques, right? Like uh, the judgment method that's just based on experience. And I, and I put it this, although this is the least accurate one, but usually at this startup phase you are in, uh, this will be a, a main, in the, the resort that you will uh, uh, rely on, but it's not the best way to, to really have uh, forecasting data. There are a lot of uh, quantitative and technical tools like the causal methods, the time series analysis, the trend projection using regression analysis and others. Uh, these are better forecasting techniques that will capture a demand pattern that can be passed on to manufacturing people. But always, always remember that all forecasting activities are wrong, right? They will always have error because nobody can see the future 100%, but a lot of them will be meaningful, will be beneficial to scratch and start the, the next documents that I'll be start speaking about. So the, this is kind of a staging and, and a prerequisite before we get into our product documents and process documents, because all these documents will require some kind of insight about demand. And the only way you can have an insight about demand is some good, useful forecasting activity. Right? If we speak about modern technology, of course, this forecasting activity is getting better and better with all these kinds of artificial intelligence that are harnessing a lot of data that's being gathered by different sensors and Internet of Things. So you guys are better off than, for example, the same team that used to do the same job 20 years ago uh, with high level of data intelligence and data analytics, yet still the same challenge of, number one, it's never 100% accurate. Number two, you will need to clear it and clean it before you directly pass it into the manufacturing process. 
I hope this is clear before we get in. If anybody would like to ask any question or comment, I'd be happy to address that. Cool. Okay. And let's keep running and let's keep flowing. Okay. Yep. First document that I'd like to speak to you about, and the first basically uh, activity within the manufacturing story is definitely what we call the, the, the activity of product development, right? And again, be listening to this lecture and or, or, or seminar and, and attending this workshop, I assume that uh, uh, all of you or most of you are in that stage where you, where you definitely did some effort in trying to develop your idea into a product. Uh, uh, so I'll not dwell a lot on that, but this is always where the story starts, right? We need to go beyond the, the, the catchy, nice idea into a real quantitative solid product that can be captured by a document like this document I'm showing you here, right? Like in true, for example, what we call a CAD file, computer aided design, uh, uh, something that will actually tell us about the dimensions of the product, the different features of the product, the uh, different material that you expect to use in the product. Uh, and usually in full fledged big companies, it's the R&D basically department that's usually responsible for that, whether they are scratching a product or, or doing a product from scratch. Uh, using a, a, an intensive research activity, or they are just improving the existing product using some development activity. This is the R and this is the D. In, in your stage as a startup, usually you are the R&D and the product development and the engineers and everything, but uh, this document need to be there and need to be as accurate, as granular, as multi-level as possible, because the more accurate it is, the more granular it is, the more uh, 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 multi-layered in terms of the different internal and external features, and uh, they are well represented using the engineering lingo, the, the better you will actually hook up and engage with the manufacturing teams next downstream, right? Because they are used to actually uh, deal with these kind of documents, the, the easier you can transfer this into what we call a CAM, a computer added manu manufacturing. I'm going to speak about that. So make sure that you have this, right? I met a couple of clients who showed me some good sketches, for example, who spoke about the, the group, the, the product in a very passionate way, but the, the you were not there yet with that. So I said, well, I, I believe in your product, but don't speak to any manufacturing people without having a document like this, right? This is how we can start the story with you, in a sense, right? Product development and the document with that. Usually, basically, the next step after a product development, and I'd like to spend some time here because this is basically what you really start to need to think about, is what we call the process plan. So of that design uh, uh, document that I, we, I showed a sample of in the previous uh, slide, uh, you start basically to speak to the manufacturing team right, that will take care of that manufacturing process of that product. And that team will always be thinking about two things. Right? They will always be look, uh, thinking about what kind of machinery uh, will be required and the tools that will be required basically uh, on these machines. So it's not just a milling process, but what kind of tooling we need on that milling process. It's not just a drilling process, for example, uh, or, uh, but what kind of tooling we have uh, and also what kind of uh, uh, scheduling. Uh, uh, and this is where the volume and the variety come to the picture that we started off with. And whether, for example, uh, you, the, you, you will suffer a lot of, for example, change over times, or can they land this product into the existing manufacturing line that they have if you are subcontracting this, for example? Uh, or how can you actually divide this if, if it's pure assembly process with very minimal manufacturing? How can you uh, divide this into different processes with the equal uh, 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 time for every station and every stage? And how can this time be hooked up with the real demand signal, what we call the tag time? So there will be a lot of work that actually will come out of that product that we, that was captured uh, uh, in, a, in a design fi file, like the, the CAD file. Uh, and this is what we call the process planning. It's basically how can you think of the activities, the manufacturing activities and the assembly activities that will actually make this product happen, will make it come to being in a sense, right? And then again, this is, uh, uh, another basically uh, uh, chart that will tell you again how they, they are looking into basically translating this product into multiple operations, sub-operations, uh, uh, tooling that will be uh, uh, needed 
And, and if you are starting your manufacturing line from scratch, you're going to buy the machines accordingly. If you have already an existing manufacturing line or you're actually joining an existing manufacturing line, this is where basically they will look into how can you land, how can they land your product into the production line uh, with the minimal effort needed in, to change, for example, tooling, jigs, fixtures, and others, right? Uh, and 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 it's 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 a quite uh, 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 an extensive process. I, I used to work for Chrysler for some time. I was part of the R and D, so I was part of the previous slide. But we were always engaged heavily with the with the with the team of that slide, right? And just switching from one model to another, this slide that you're look you're looking at uh, is number one a very costly slide. So. Uh, to switch from uh, uh, the minivan that used to be a little bit curvy and round of the uh, of, of uh, the Chrysler, if you if you see any of them still on the street, this is one from two thousand and four till maybe two thousand and twelve and or ten, and then into this box shape of the minivan that's still running till today. This because there were a lot of tooling and jigging uh, uh, to be changed. Uh, the, the the retooling and the, just switching from one model to another cost Chrysler at that time around fifty million dollars, and it was three months basically planned. I'm not speaking, of course, that you will engage in something like this, the huge difference of scale, but this is a a real activity, process planning and switching designs into what kind of activities we need at the production level, at the manufacturing level, at the assembly level, what kind of machinery and tools. Uh, uh, will always be a necessity, whether it's at a big scale or at a small scale like you guys, right? So always think of that and 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 look into developing this uh, uh, document. This is uh, just a sample of a process uh, plan. Uh, basically, as you can see, uh, the, you're speaking about specific uh, process uh, that will do a specific step. Here is the setup. Here are all the different tasks and different work elements that will happen into it. Uh, if you're going to do some assembly, usually there is kind of an SOP, standard operating procedure, that will look into things and say, okay, we're going to assemble this and then that. Uh, and again, just giving you some uh, uh, flavor of documents that, that you will generate as you evolve into your manufacturing story and manufacturing dream. So product de uh, development with a design a document, process planning with a, with a manufacturing plan or an assembly plan document or documents uh, need also to be there. Uh, uh, the last thing about the product documents will be uh, the bill of material or the bond, and this is also a very fundamental document, and it's basically a break uh, uh, up of or an exclusion of your final product, right? Like, for example, this uh, leather uh, uh, back chair, you would like to break it down, you would like to explode it into its different elements and components or different materials that are constituting this end product. And then you'd like to stack them in a document. And this is why it's called bill of material, right? So, uh, and, and this is very important for you to know, for example, what materials you need to have, which of these materials can be sourced locally, globally, what, which one of them you have, for example, in your inventory, or you can actually uh, uh, have it from a, a close by sister company, for example. Another way to basically generate that bill of material instead of just graphically exploding the product into its just uh, different uh, uh, components is to do what we call the product tree, right? And this is even more and more familiar when you deal with practitioners in the field. They will ask you, do you have a bomb? Do you have a product tree, right? A product tree is, again, a breakdown of the final product. Like, for example, it's usually the highest block in that uh, 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 chart. And then you break it down into its next uh, uh, semi-finished product, into its next sub-assembly, into its next sub-sub-assembly, all the way till you reach the lowest layer, which is just components and parts. And again, uh, supply chain departments, people use this. Uh, uh, purchasing people use this. Uh, process planning people also would like to know different uh, assembly process expected using, uh, sometimes you use this uh, uh, product tree uh, uh, form of the bill of material. Right? So the, bo the bomb or the bill of material is also another very important uh, uh, documents that you need to have uh, among your list of documents that relates to the product. This is just, a, again, a sample of a bill of material. Uh, a uh, and you can see they call it component, component list. Uh, uh, and uh, this is basically just a listing of 
uh, different components that constitute a specific product. And of course, you can add layers and layers of different useful information, like not just the list of components, but for example, how many, and this is extremely important, how many of each of them you need for every product. So now how many screws per component, how many washers per component, how many, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 pipes per uh, end, end product, for example, because you will use this bill of material, uh, th these numbers to multiply basically, uh, uh, to multiply it as a number of times the demand data and know exactly the level of materials that you need to purchase or secure or have in your inventory, for example. You can add in front of every component of these components that constitute an end product, who is the supplier or who is the manufacturer, or if you're going to manufacture it, what's your lead time, for example, for that. So you have a very good information uh, 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 visibility of uh, the state of material. Because uh, when, we, when it comes to manufacturing, one of the very important things you need to make sure that you never ever would basically fall into is that the production line that's very expensive with the resources on it is stopped because of lack of material. I can't produce because I don't have the components. And I think uh, post-COVID, we, we say that we are post-COVID, hopefully, we all sensed, and specifically people in the manufacturing and supply chain field sensed really the, the how hurtful it is and how costly it is to really stop production because you don't have material or components or parts to really to produce. So uh, bill of material will open a lot of doors in that, right? It will not just give you an overview of what components you need, but where to get them from, how many of them, or what alternative suppliers, all these kind of stuff. So uh, basically, you, uh, let me pause here a little bit. And uh, this, these, these are the three documents that are actually product related. And if you are building your manufacturing plan and, and manufacturing endeavor, uh, uh, make sure that you have these documents associated with a product that you are trying to manufacture. Questions, comments? Hmm, how do you guys feel about that so far? Anybody or in the chat? Nothing clear? Yeah. I don't like these online uh, seminars because they're usually less interactive than basically asking in specific individuals. So what do you do? How do you do this? Or how do, uh, in your company, what do you do that? So help me to engage you guys by just thinking about how these things relate to your own product or your own company. Uh, okay. Uh, so Steve from thank you uh, for your comments. Yes. Okay. So if it's clear, then let's keep going. Okay, so now we switch into the process story of the side uh, uh, side of the story, uh, and uh, I'll start basically with uh, uh, this document. Uh, we call it the SOP. SOP in the manufacturing world has two meanings. The if you are a very operational guy, you know, then they would basically uh, stand for standard operating procedure, which is very similar to the process plan that we or comes out of the process plan that we just discussed. But here. At that process level, it's basically, it refers to the sales and operation planning, SOP. And SOP is, this is basically, you remember when I told you you need to do a very good forecasting activities and then don't just throw the demand data that you captured using like uh, the, the forecasting techniques into the manufacturing people because it will be very erratic, very sometimes random. It's very difficult to handle. Usually you massage it a little bit. You start to really uh, uh, manage it a little bit and then throw it into this document, because this is the document that the manufacturing people will always look into. They will ask about what kind of sales do you expect? So this is the S in the SOP. They are expecting some input from marketing teams, from the forecasting teams that will give them, this is the sales level that we are expecting. And again, you will not throw the exact individual my, uh, detailed daily or hourly demand because manufacturing people at this aggregate level they really can't deal with this very uh, 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 granular data, but we, they are expecting some kind of uh, aggregation. And this is where uh, uh, you start to aggregate your data and take off the different trends and the different, uh, uh, and of course, include what you expect in terms of seasonality, but you try to really massage a little bit the, uh, the data here. And uh, it, it's at that stage, at that very aggregate sta stage in big companies, this is usually a higher level of managers that, that, that generate that basically uh, document. 
they will think about what kind of operation, what kind of manufacturing capacity do we need so that we can fulfill the, fulfill these sales requirements. This is why it's called sales and operation planning. We need to plan our operations according to the sales signal so that at the end of this planning period, all sales are hopefully fulfilled by some kind of manufacturing and capacity planning. So this is where we, they decide, for example, we need to produce 200 parts every month, for example, or we need to have a buy a weekly production of 20,000 uh, 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 products, or I will generate, for example, seven uh, uh, services of that kind every week, for example. This is kind of an output, right? So the output of, or, uh, of this activity of generating this SOP document is to have an idea about your expected productivity and the required capacity to fulfill that productivity. So how many people do you need to hire accordingly? How much machinery do you need to have? What kind of uh, scaling up or scaling down of your capacity you need to actually engage in, right? Uh, uh, given the, this uh, sales horizon that have been passed to you from the activity, the forecasting activity. Uh, uh, so, and again, this basically chart in front of you is kind of how we teach this to our students but practically speaking, uh, some of these steps are either combined together or uh, you don't need to do every single step, but you can see that the SOP here is an upper stage that will be followed by different documents that we're gonna be discussing the, uh, next, right? But you need forecasting data, you need constraint management. For example, I need to hire people, but I know that the maximum according to the uh, labor law, for example, is to hire, to get them to work eight hours a shift. So you need to tell me if this is the required workforce level, then I, I need to abide by these, for example, labor loads, or for example, the constraint management, my budget capacity is max, maxed at 50K. Uh, so I can't get all this uh, six axis machine, for example, I, I can work with three axis machine, uh, and thus I will get maybe two of these and I will, I will slow down my production for whatever reason. So this is constraint management also. Operation strategy, again, this is where the concept of make to stock, make to order, assemble to order, what kind of strategy are you positioning yourself within? High responsiveness level, or you're gonna act, so you need high level of inventory, you're gonna stock, or can you wait a little bit and be maybe assembled to order? And of course, budget and the annual plan is a very important basically uh, of money so that you can have a realistic plan. So SOP, this is kind of the rough cut capacity activity uh, where you have an idea about the sales and then you start to think about your manufacturing process and system, what kind of productivity do you need to have per month, per week, per uh, quarter, per year, and accordingly how you will secure capacity for that. Right? And this is again where a discussion of make or buy, so should I make this capacity in-house or should I buy, for example, or outsource basically this uh, from outside. Uh, this is a, a, a very simple example of an SOP uh, plan or a document. And you can see, for example, uh, this uh, highlighted in yellow, this is kind of the last three months is the history, but basically starting off that, you'll find if it's a plan, for example, for April, May, June, July, all these uh, months, this is basically the forecast that we are expecting. And uh, we need to have some kind of idea of operation. So uh, the, the line in, in the middle under the operation section, this is, kind of what, this is what kind of capacity I can have. And you can see that in many cases, the capacity is either higher or lower than the expected forecasting, the forecasted demand uh, uh, per month. Again, this is the reality of manufacturing. This is how fast maybe I can respond uh, to a change in capacity. It will take me at least one month to hire new people or to ramp up production. Uh, uh, and thus I need to really uh, 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 act accordingly. And also it always take into account what inventory you have or you'll be carrying over from previous uh, months so that you don't really end up with over uh, uh, producing or, or, or a lot of inventory piled up with all the risk of obsolescence and losing that inventory. So an, an, uh, an insight on sales, an idea about your capa uh, uh, operation capacity, and a good information about your current inventory, all of them will give you a rollout plan in the future of how you will actually be producing. This is kind of a very rough cut capacity planning and production scheduling to the future at an aggregate level, at a monthly level, at a quarter level. It's not the daily scheduling production yet. Clear? Okay. So moving on, and we're still in the uh, uh, 
uh, pro, uh, manufacturing process documents, the next would be, and this is very important, and I will spend some time on that. This is what we call MRP, Material Requirement Planning, MRP. Uh, and you will hear this document a lot, and you will see multiple versions of it. Some of them are extremely detailed, others are a little bit more summarized. But the idea of this basically document is to make sure that based on that production capacity that you have been planning in the SOP, you made all the effort to ensure that you will not stop uh, responding to the customer demand because you don't have capacity, right? You, in, you secure the capacity, you ensure the capacity through a good SOP planning. In this stage, you would like to make the same thing. You'd like to ensure that you will not miss a demand and you will not uh, uh, be responsive to the customer demand, not because you don't have capacity, but because you don't have components and material, right? And this is where you will translate all these production scheduling that you and the production level that you uh, generated in the SOP, you will translate this into the requirement and the equivalent components and, uh, uh, and, and material. And how would you do that? Simply by multiplying the SOP times the bill of material. If I'd like to produce 20 parts a month, or 20 uh, products a month, and each of these component uh, products will require five components of A, then 20 times five, I need to make sure that every month I have 100 A components. Otherwise, I would not be able to produce the 20 A pro the, the 20 products, right? Because I'm missing A component, right? And that's why I told you the bill of material is very important. It will be used in this stage also. So basically with the SOP, with the bill of material, with of course the information about what inventory are you holding, you will generate a material requirement plan. And it's a plan because as the production plan is rolling in the future, uh, telling you as expected every month how much you're going to produce, you will also, MRP will generate a, a rolling plan in the future every month, how, what type of material and how much of that material you need to either order or grab from your inventory or manufacture uh, in your, for example, a job shop or whatever, uh, to make sure that, for example, you start in May, so that you're done by June, and thus the July production is secured. So it takes also the lead time into uh, uh, consideration. And again, it's not this is not a workshop about how to uh, uh, develop and generate MRP, because this is definitely a discussion by itself, but this is what this document is actually telling you. And again, this is a quick glimpse into what is uh, uh, MRP. So MRP basically, or how does it look like? Uh, again, you can see on the top uh, row there, uh, uh, you will see that this is the planning horizon. So over the coming eight months, for example, I know that on, on the first month, uh, uh, I will have an order. I'm forecasting to have an order of around uh, uh, 150 uh, of, of a specific chair, for example, and each of these chairs will require one of this uh, uh, specific component. So I will multiply this times the one. If it's two, then I'm, I'm multiply it times two. And then I see if, if there is any kind of similar components coming due to different other orders. And uh, if I have anything on my inventory and then the, the very important basically uh, uh, management decision that will come out of this document is the last row here. You see planned order release. It will tell you when to release a purchase order to your supplier usually or to even your warehouse or to your other company that's manufacturing these components. I know that in order, for example, to fulfill the first row up there of the demand, I need to make sure that I order this specific component at these periods. This, this is the amount at this period, right? And this is just one sheet for one component. Every single component will have its own MRP. And this is why definitely at a big level, you can't handle this on an Excel sheet, for example. And this is where the ERP systems and the computer systems come to the picture. Right, a, a complicated product like a, a vehicle with more than 120,000 different components getting into this vehicle, you can imagine how much uh, effort you need to have. But again, at your stage, if you're looking into a, a compo a, an end product with maybe 20 or 25 uh, different components and, and parts, uh, it's still manageable. You can do it using some Excel. At, and if you understand how to generate an MRP with a very good accurate bomb, you can be on top of things. Usually, this is the task of either uh, uh, MRP uh, uh, engineers or uh, supply chain department or uh, inventory and warehousing uh, uh, team to make sure that they are actually covering the back. They got the back of the production peak. I don't want to stop production because either I don't have a capacity or I don't have a material. 
right? Make sure this is, these are the two very important precautions in the manufacturing story, right? You have a demand, I'd like to chase it, but I can't, why? I don't have capacity or I don't have, I'm out of components or material. Never ever dip into this situation. Clear? Comments, questions? Just a, a, a personal, basically, uh, uh, story that just happened yesterday. And again, to give you an insight about how this MRP thing can be even at a big level. So I was actually, I had to drive all the way uh, down to Santa Barbara to get my Audi fixed because there is no Audi dealership here. Uh, and uh, I have this scheduled one month ago. This maintenance schedule is one month ago. So I drive all the way down, right? And I, I get my car in. And then waiting in the uh, customer area room, they come to me and tell me we are extremely sorry. We, they needed to do three things. The, the, the last thing, they actually, the, the part is coming tomorrow. So I couldn't actually help myself from standing in the middle of that room with all these technicians around me and start to give them a lecture about what is MRP. And this is exactly what I'm speaking about. Right? You can't have a customer coming with an order or a demand and you have the capacity, you have already the people and the time and everything, and you can't fulfill the order because you're out of material, right? You don't have an MRP system. If you had an MRP system expecting these visits on that day, they would ask what would be the requirement of that visit. This is the bill of material. This is the bomb of a service, right? An Audi that's requiring this kind of, of fixing, the bomb of this service is one, two, three, four, five. Before this customer comes in, do we have these things or not, right? And again, this is why we are running these kind of uh, uh, systems and documents to make sure that this will never happen, happen in the manufacturing or a service activity. It's a manufacturing or service as I just shared with you guys. Okay, and I have to drive again tomorrow. They gave me a car basically, a better car than mine. So I'm enjoying the new car, but uh, it's definitely a hassle. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, now, the, 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 the last basically thing that I'd like to share with you before we go to the quality control is relating to, again, our discussion about components and materials and uh, uh, production is, in many cases, you would be getting this production capacity or these components from external suppliers. Right? The Thursday session is totally for those who are going to be doing the whole business as outsourced. But of course, even if you're doing a lot of manufacturing yourself or you're planning to do some manufacturing yourself, you will actually definitely be hooking up with multiple suppliers, either upstream or downstream. Right? So now we are teaching our students uh, that it's not anymore an enterprise against an enterprise in the global competition, but it's a supply chain against a supply chain. Whether you like it or not, you're going to be part of a team. So this will actually bring some maybe useful discussion regarding uh, uh, how to think about uh, uh, suppliers and how to manage mainly your suppliers. So I, I'll, how to how to outsource and select a supplier. Uh, I will not dwell on it that much uh, because this will be Thursday uh, a workshop if you'd like to attend. But I will speak a little bit given that you already kind of landed a, a short list of suppliers. Uh, uh, what you need to do. So number one is to you need to, before selecting a supplier, you need to do some, as I said, some sourcing activities and uh, uh, you need to have basically uh, uh, an RFS, which is a, a request for uh, 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 supply. So we basically, if or, or supplier, if, if you are planning on, for example, uh, 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 manufacturing uh, at a manufacturer in India or in Malaysia or in uh, China, you will need to, before even asking about the price, you need to have a request for the specifications that this supplier actually has. What kind of productivity, what's, uh, what kind of quality level uh, uh, do they actually uh, have uh, uh, and, and testing and all these kind of technical manufacturing specs before getting into the quotation. Don't get into the request of quotation, which is out of Q, the next one, because this would be almost tempting. You will have a very cheap, basically, quote, usually, for manufacturing, and uh, you will be tempted to accept it, even if there are some downside of it. Now, pay attention to the request for specification and the request for supply, basically. So how, how, how far can you uh, uh, respond to a sudden change in order, for example, and how fast can you scale up your production and uh, what's your quality testing criteria and procedure. All these kind of things before going to the RFQ, which is the request for quotation, 
And then once you are content with the specs and the specification in terms of productivity and manufacturing, and, and the quote uh, is, is good, the cost is good, then you start to get into the purchasing and the contracting procedure, which is again, not the scope of this basically uh, 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 workshop, but, uh, but definitely this comes later on again, because purchasing and contracting is also extremely important in making sure that what you agreed upon in the RFS and the RFQ is actually well documented in this contract with some good flexibility on your side that will give you some room to maybe change some order, scale up or scale down, uh, very, very, very heavy on the quality side of things and who will be responsible for it and all this kind of stuff. Also part of the supplier management as you are building your manufacturing process is what we call supplier assessment. Because even if you start to set a supplier in motion with you as a partner, you, that you shouldn't basically get them off the hook uh, 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 and you, you should always be under assessment and the assessment here in terms of cost, in terms of quality, in terms of delivery, in terms of ease to work with, in terms of flexibility. Uh, and I'll show you a sample of a supplier assessment document where you can capture these things at a very aggregate level and you can go in details. Also, it's important with the supplier management uh, system that you're building is to pay attention to the inventory management side of that uh, 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 activity and that team and need to integrate uh, your inventory records that are usually uh, based on some warehousing activity with the supplier management team so that they are on top of things. Are you reaching a reorder point soon or not? The quality level that uh, uh, you are receiving in, in the incoming inspection of these things. Uh, uh, for example, uh, they, they will always be hooked up with the MRP, which is hooked up with the production. So the inventory records will always be a good reflection of how urgent you need to quickly ask for another code or another uh, 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 quantity and all these kinds of stuff. So the, and this is why the, the, the supplier management team is usually the, your mo most upstream interface with your uh, uh, supplier network and manufacturing network and the production team with the MRP and with all these SNOP are usually in the heart of the midstream pumping machine of products. The, the coupling happens through this inventory management system and team and documents. And you need to make sure that all these documents are speaking to one another and, and that they are really interfacing. This is basically a simple uh, uh, just illustration of supplier evaluation, how to think about it, right? So you can uh, evaluate them based on the purchasing uh, activities uh, and, 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 and how good they are. Uh, and the purchasing team usually look into that in terms of the quantity that they are offering you and the cost and the price and the quality. Also the logistics side is very important. Sometimes it's not just the, 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 the supplier, but who will deliver all, the, all these parts into the production line itself and who will be responsible for anything that's bad, uh, uh, the, the invoicing, the contracting, all these things are very important. Uh, this is basically a simple uh, form that uh, uh, some companies use to uh, evaluate the supplier. And you can see basically they, they, they uh, choose the evaluation criteria, quality, for example, and then the quality is actually detailed in terms of uh, the uh, quality of uh, uh, the components, the company history, uh, the quality of the sample, look into the, for example, performance, uh, technical ability, capacity, technician assistance. So you can detail each of these KPIs or key performance uh, uh, indices and uh, put a, some detailed sub KPIs and then you start to rate them based on from a Likert scale, for example, from one to five, one to 10, and then you put your comments. The, the idea here is make sure that you are always continuously uh, assessing your suppliers and, and, and sharing with them your assessment and uh, acting upon that, punishing them, for example, switching supplier. Uh, because believe me, if, if you want the supplier feel that they are off the hook and uh, that you are a guaranteed customer, you will take a back seat for, for them to hook up with another new customer and give them the full attention and you will be struggling. So, and this is, we will discuss this in details on Thursday when we speak about supplier management in details. But part of the manufacturing process, even if you are in the direction of having things in-house and manufacturing as much as possible of your products, you will always be engaged with some suppliers either for to uh, manufacture some of the components or maybe scale up because you can't scale the full uh, orders by yourself. And this is why we're speaking about supplier uh, management. 
So before getting into the quality, let me pause here maybe a couple of minutes. If you have any questions about what we discussed in terms of the manufacturing process so far, so we spoke about the uh, SNOP, right, as a capacity planning, rough cut capacity planning uh, uh, and productivity expectations uh, uh, documents. And then we spoke about the MRP uh, and uh, how this is a very important document to make sure that you have enough material as you roll in the future of the production plan. And then how this is always linked with a supplier uh, somehow. So the supplier management uh, process that we touched on quickly. This was the summary of that last section. So questions, comments, how do you guys feel about that? Hmm. Clear? Well, I hope that it's that clear and I didn't put you guys to sleep. Uh, I know it's, it's a lot of information, but we're trying to squeeze a lot of things in uh, one hour and, and, and 15 minutes. And I also am, I'm, I'm keen to give you enough time at the end uh, to really uh, open up and tell me about what you guys are doing on manufacturing plans so that we can basically also relate this to our reality. We have a question here. Okay. Oh, then it's here. Okay. <laughs> Good to see you later. <laughs> okay. Cool. So let me move in, uh, move on, I mean, and uh, speak about this last uh, element uh, uh, that I'd like to discuss with you, which is the quality management uh, uh, and the quality side of that story, right? So we spoke about the product side, the process side in terms of manufacturing, but uh, definitely quality is an integral part of this whole manufacturing planning. And if you are planning to do things in-house, make sure that you have some energy and time and budget and personnel for this quality management things. First thing I'd like to actually speak about is the quality assurance, because people mix between quality assurance and quality control, and both of them are part of what we call quality management, right? Uh, we can speak a lot about the different uh, quality uh, uh, management tools out there, like Lean and Six Sigma and TQM Total Quality Management, but this is not definitely the scope of, of this quick overview. I'd like to make sure that you guys understand some key points. So when we speak about quality assurance, we are speaking about the system in place that speaks to quality, that tries to capture quality. And we have a set of documents, for example, uh, like, for example, we will, anything that we will receive, we will have an incoming inspection to it, right? And we have a document and the purchase order will not be released unless the IQC, the incoming quality control document is signed by X or Y. If you have this system in place, then you have a quality assurance system, right? And this is usually what the ISOs, the different, some of the ISOs out there will actually focus on. And a lot of companies are bragging about having ISO as a signal of good quality, which is not true. ISO is a signal of having a quality system in place, but whether it will produce a good quality or not, it's a different story because you can have a very good system with garbage in, really giving garbage out, right? It's, this can happen in a sense, right? But usually the system will, will evolve and enforce good practice and, and, and things to be better. But quality assurance is a little bit different than what I'd like to speak next about, which is basically quality control. The quality control here is basically the specific technical quality activities that will basically be engaged in. And of course, uh, this quality is always very important, but it's extremely important at the startup phase of all starting up companies and, and, and uh, uh, enterprises, because this is how you build your reputation with your uh, uh, customers. And this is how you're going to position yourself in the market and all these kinds of stuff. So we need really to pay a lot of attention to quality control. Usually by quality control, we are speaking about some specific things. On top of the list would be what kind of testing are you actually carrying uh, 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 on or, or, or having in your production story, right? Whether it is in the production line itself or at your warehouse or at your finished uh, good inventory warehouse, are you doing some testing or not? And by testing, we are testing components, we are testing uh, uh, end products, and we are testing functionalities also, right? So there are a lot of, for example, loading testing that need to be happening, a lot of functional testing that need to be happening, uh, uh, and then it's, it's a long, long story and definitely depends on the type of product and the type of service that you are uh, uh, engaged in. Also, part of the quality control is the sampling planning that's happening. Right? So having a sampling system is part of the quality assurance, but the details of that depends on what kind of control you like to have. And I'll share with you in the next slide an example of that, but usually it's the questions of 
uh, uh, should we sample or not? How much should we sample? And how often should we sample? So should I sample, for example, every day, every shift, every batch, how often? And should I sample how much out of the 110, out of the 120, out of the 102? And even if I answer these questions, the next question would be, what would be my AQL, my acceptance quality level? And in the sampling case, for example, if I sample five and I find one bad and four good, should I accept a lot or should I reject a lot? If I find two, and all these are technical details, right? Just under the sampling plan of this of one activity of the quality control. AQL extends to a lot of things. So testing, for example, if you put, for example, uh, uh, an assembled electronic component, for example, under a functionality test, and what would be my acceptance quality level? Should it fail after 20 hours of working or 30 hours of working or five hours or shouldn't it ever fail, for example? All these are technical details, right? If we are doing something that's chemical, for example, what kind of hazardous tests I need to do? What kind of leaking tests I need to do? Uh, uh, aesthetic, basically, uh, uh, tests or, or looking, painting, for example, all these things. So there are a lot of details that's definitely function in the product that you guys are uh, uh, doing and engaged in. But uh, uh, this is basically a very important thing to think about at the beginning. And it's very challenging, I have to tell you, especially if you are, for example, off college and you're looking, uh, you don't have that experience, you have a brilliant idea, you manage to design it, you manage to have a good, basically, prototype of it. And you would like to make sure that it's of a high quality. How can you test that? And, uh, this is usually one of the very big hurdles that I, I, I discussed with many companies before uh, in, 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 uh, in startups and incubators. Uh, uh, and, and usually, if you are a very close to a sister product that's very similar to you, you can actually cheat, in a sense, from an established product. Like, so if you are looking into, for example, something that uh, have uh, that, that you would like to make sure that doesn't leak, you can go to a very close product like you, and look into their leaking testing. For example, what testing test they are doing and what kind of uh, specs are they holding the products up to? Or if you are, if it's a common, uh, if some components of it are common standard components, you can go into the uh, standard testing of the ASTM, for example, and others. Or sometimes you can come up with your own testing, right? And, and, and you can basically tell your customers, this is how I tested it, for example, uh, my functional test, my durability test. Uh, but you have you have definitely to, uh, if, it's, if it's a food product, definitely it's a different side, a different total story of testing here. You are definitely allied with a lot of regulations here in addition to your own specific uh, uh, case. So uh, this is something that you need really to be busy with, right? And make sure that you have enough resources uh, for it. Uh, this is uh, just, uh, uh, again, I'd like to share some documents to give you a flavor of what we're speaking about. So this is, for example, an inspection sheet of an incoming quality control or uh, uh, an outgoing quality control of, for example, a specific components or parts or an end product. And again, you can see, for example, in the, in the main table down here, what kind of tests are you holding this product or component into it? For example, just a visual inspection or maybe tension test or uh, 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 in-circuit testing ICT, for example, uh, for electronic component. And then what kind of specification? Right? What, this is the AQL basically that uh, is when would it pass and when would it not pass and when would it need, for example, re-inspection or retesting, for example, and what kind of results? And again, the system that will that, that design that basically document that will assign who to do this document and, and, and make sure that uh, it's well placed within the process. This is quality assurance. Doing these tests itself is the quality control and all this under the quality management, just to make sure that, again, the full picture is clear there. This is basically, uh, again, a sample of the inspection planning, for example. And again, this is from a, a standard code uh, all these letters that basically uh, uh, you see on the uh, left side is basically uh, tells you about the batch size, uh, what kind of level of production. Remember our discussion early on when I told you you need to be aware of what kind of volume are you looking at. So if your batch size is, for example, between 50 and 100, you're going to take the letter B, for example. If it is between 1,000 and 3,000, you're going to go for letter G, for example. And again, this is basically uh, depending on what kind of industry and what kind of products, and you can you and, and you can sample as you like. And these the, the next column will be the suggested sample size, and you can see as the batch size increase, the sample size will increase, 
And then uh, the next rows will be basically the accepting and rejection level. So take a sample of 200, accept if there is zero defect, this is the zero. If it's one defect, then reject the whole thing. In other samples, you can see you can even accept it with three bad. Uh, 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 and, uh, but if you hit the fourth bad in the sample of 2000, then you have basically a, a, an issue. And this is again, depending on uh, how these, how uh, granular you would like to be and how uh, 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 strict you'd like to be. And uh, the very interesting thing here is that if you are sampling, for example, from a supplier, you can hold the supplier at the beginning into a very high level of acceptance and rejection level. And once you start to have this continuous partnership with, with, with that supplier and trust the supplier and you start to really realize that that supplier is of a good quality, you can relax a little bit the AQL, the acceptance, acceptance and rejection level. And then once there is a problem, you can bounce back to the uh, basically tight uh, standard that you had earlier. So the dynamicity and the fluidity of that is also something that the quality team always uh, think about. So this was kind of a quick uh, uh, touch on the quality as, as a very important element of uh, the manufacturing planning and dream.